The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everybody. Thanks for attending today's Coffee with Kalefi webinar, Domestic Hot Water Recirculation in High-Rise Buildings. I'm Kevin Freet with Kalefi North America, sitting in for Bob Rohr, who is traveling somewhere in Pennsylvania. He may join us uh, if he gets an opportunity later. Anyway, I'm very excited to welcome our distinguished guest speaker, a colleague and an industry expert, Claudio Artizoia from our headquarters in Italy. Welcome, Claudio. Hi, Kevin. Hi, everybody. I'm very pleased of being here to participate in this webinar. Thank you. A couple that are uh, related to today's presentation are these two, number 21 and 22. Uh, the recirculation balancing and then uh, master mixing valves, the, um, um, the one you see on the right there. So those are awesome. If you don't have those, you'll, you'll want those. So here's Claudio. Uh, he is a mechanical engineer with over 30 years experience in design and development of hydronics and plumbing products and HVAC systems too. So very strong background. Claudio is instrumental in the certification and approval process of products for uh, North America, the European Union and uh, Australian marketplace too. So he's a global guy. Uh, he's an active member of a technical committee in Europe which is dedicated to the prevention of Legionella in domestic hot water systems. And we're very excited to, to have him here. And uh, in just a few slides, I'm going to turn it over to him. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. The topics today, a um, number of different topics. We'll talk about static pressure. Uh, we will talk about recirculation loops. Do we have one large loop or do we have to divide those into zones? The water heater, where do they get located? Uh, on the roof, in the basement, somewhere in between. We will talk about PRVs. It gets tricky when you talk about PRVs and research and high rise and Claudio will tell you all about that. Do you need them in the research piping? This is a question that we get sometimes here. Do we put PRVs in the research piping? And, and the answer is coming soon. How do you balance? In, in high rise, the recirculation risers. What about master mixing valves? How do they work? So these are all the topics we'll cover in the next hour. And um, the importance of Legionella too, of course, a hot topic, right? Um, you're seeing articles, we're talking about that. And we have a very detailed presentation for another day, uh, if you've seen it or not, but uh, we'll touch on that today in high rises too. So um, to kick it off, let me just uh, start by framing um, the importance of static pressure. Okay, so if we look at a column of water that's one foot uh, in height, that will measure 0.433 PSI. This is some basic stuff, but I think it's good to set the stage for Claudio's discussion. So if we set a floor in a high rise, you know, is somewhere around 12 feet, what we can do is you know, round off and just say that's five PSI. So those of us here in the States, it's kind of an easy rule of thumb j just to estimate things without using a calculator. And if we do that, um, we can look at a, a stack like this, a, uh, a static uh, high rise would look something like this. Let's assume a couple of things first, that the minimum pressure we need for our fixtures is 35 and the maximum is 80. What that means there is one PRV could serve about five floors. So let's say we had a supply at the top of the building um, and we, uh, we, we had the pressure set at 35. Now, as you go down from floors 30 to 29, 28, you know, 27, 26, what happens? That static pressure builds up, right? So when we get down to floor 21, we're at 80 PSI. Okay, anywhere past that, we have to put a PRV. We have to reduce that pressure because I told you our fixtures can't handle over 80. So as you drop down further, you're going to have to put a PRV in there. So we could put it here on floor 16 or we could put it here on floor 20 to handle this group and keep these uh, circuits in between 60 and 80. And the same goes for all these other loops coming down here. So this is just you know your basic understanding of head pressure, uh, static pressure in a building. And the same rules apply if you're coming from the ground floor up, okay? It's no different. You're just starting off with the high pressure at the bottom 
and making sure that the upper floors have at least 35 PSI so that those fixtures work as well. So all these things you have to consider, right? The building height, uh, you need to know the municipal water pressure, uh, the fixture re requirements and flow requirements. Some of those fixtures require 45 PSI to work properly, for example. So you have to know that. If we need booster pumps, we need to talk about that and, and the water heater system. So there's a lot that gets involved here and uh, we're going to get into some of that in good detail. So, so what I wanna do at this point is um, turn, turn it over to, to Claudio. And uh, so again, welcome Claudio, thanks, thanks for being here. We are literally in the same office. We're sitting next to each other in my office in Milwaukee. So I'm gonna pass the baton over to Claudio. Hi, thanks Kevin. We'd, I would like to start with this uh, presentation directly with some real examples, just for giving an idea, a general idea and overview of what we, we will see later on. So the typical example, we start with first uh, 20 stories building. So no, normally eight is um, okay, 28 feet as a maximum height and you have the maximum pressure at the bottom level is 120 PSI. So normally in this type of building, one loop for recirculation hot water is enough. Second example, we, we double the number of stories more or less. So we reach 48 feet in terms of eight, eight of the building and 40 stories normally is the, the average. But at this, this type of buildings are quite tricky because the maximum pressure at the bottom levels reaches 200 PSI. And here important to, to consider is can be one or two loops. Third example is that we went with the, the height of the building is so high, so 90 stories, 1,100 1, feet. Uh, it's difficult actually to manage the maximum pressure at the bottom levels, so it's quite impossible. So we, we need to split the system in two or three or even four loops uh, just to overcome the pressure. Example here, just a diagram showing where the hot water production is on, on top of the building. And we have one large recirculation loop for more than 30 stories. In this case, at the bottom level, we can reach critical levels in terms of pressure. So the bottom floor would have inlet pressure above or roughly above 150 PSI and the pressure limits of the equipment and fittings have to be considered and roughly for the right selection of the fittings. And PIVs have to be installed and branched off uh, the recirculation line. So another possible uh, alternative way of controlling the, the pressure and the recirculation is to, have, is to create a zone uh, using a heat exchanger. So in this case, a secondary loop pressure is controlled with a PLV station here. Operation is, uh, of the circuit can be open or closed. We have this configuration and a possible different way of applying in a, in a real system in a single or multiple zone. And the control of secondary loop with dedicated pump, expansion vessel and relief valve uh, drives the system to be a little bit uh, expensive and obviously requires accurate commissioning. It is that the control has to be accurate and serve it several times. And other example, more or less with the same logic. So we have here the same principle, but with all the equipment in one single box, heat exchanger, pump station, expansion vessel, and so on. And then distribution, it can be multiple zone, for instance, or another application of the same principle same concept but single zone and the the main riser divided and split in two parts where the first uh, top level uh, act as a primary on on the heat exchanger and on the secondary loop we reach the bottom levels controlling the pressure with the same principle with a high with a prb station second another of the questions was uh, where is the water heater located in a high rise well Hot water production can be located on the roof, in the basement, or at intermediate levels. Example here, water heater is on the roof. And obviously we have to consider design for the hot water distribution. So hydrostatic pressure is the limit, mainly the limit of the equipment. Boosting station have to be selected and for the proper pressure, okay? 
and service work, a helicopter crane. So you have also to consider that when you reach a higher, uh, at the top level, you need helicopter to move equipment or big cranes. So also those things have to be uh, checked. And obviously, if we, if we split the, the loop in two parts and the system in two parts because of the height of the building, we have to consider the cost of the dedicated technical level. And for some residential area, this, this is a very appreciable cost. Another example, instead of the roof, we can have the production of the hot water system with or without the storage at, uh, at the in the basement, at the bottom level. Or in case of um, high rise building, we can split in two parts. So we have a dedicated level and the system with its own uh, bo booster pump station serving the top, uh, the intermediate level. So the system is split actually in two parts and we control the pressure in a better way. Now, we I would like to take the occasion for uh, introducing and considering an important point uh, um, within the use of PRVs and in a high-rise building, especially where you have, you have high hydrostatic uh, inlet pressure. So cavitation. Cavitation occurs where is a physical phenomenon that uh, most people, most designers know, occurs when local static pressure in a fluid reaches a level below the water pressure of the lipid at that actual temperature. Typical example of cavitation, we have a PRV that controls the pressure and obviously the PRV uh, works on um, with an obturator and a, and a seat and the stem and the, the flow passage through the through the seat in case of a very low flow or and high pressure difference between the inlet and outlet can drive uh, the system and the PRV to create uh, cavitation. So we have bubble formation and implosion of the uh, bubble uh, after after the, the reduced section. And you can obviously experience following this phenomenon, you can experience, unfortunately, vibration, noise, and damage to valve and piping. So cavitation is a sort of, uh, how to say, general overview of what is happening and we have a method for controlling cavitation, so we work uh, on the on the pressure ratio upstream with downstream, so to be kept under control and ideally in two to one or no greater than three to one. And all manufacturers they uh, make those uh, those type of diagrams available for the right selection, so you have a good working uh, area where the, the the PRV has to work. In case uh, you exceed these, these values, it's good to have a, a design review or a, the evaluation of a different strategy. So including uh, the first the staging of pressure using first stage PRVs. This is a typical example. So the first stage PRV is, can, can be one of the, of the possible solutions. So the high pressure drop between inlet and outlet is split in two parts. The first valve is a, is a first stage uh, so-called first stage PRV controls the drop of pressure between the inlet and the and to an intermediate level. So for instance, from 240 down to 120 PSI. And the second stage acts as a traditional uh, PRV, normally set at uh, 60 PSI at the outlet, but with an incoming pressure limited to 120. So in this case, all problem created to a cavitation is, um, is solved because it, it, the, the two pressure, uh, the two pressure reducing valves are um, working in pair to combine and to uh, accommodate the, the so high pressure ratio. Another thing that we have to consider in this uh, installation can be high low demand in terms of uh, flow rate, uh, um, <clears throat> in terms of flow rate change and flow rate condition. So we have this possible solution as a bypass solution. So you have a small valve, uh, normally half inch valve set for 60 PSI and uh, in parallel, working in parallel with a one inch and a quarter valve set for a lower uh, set pressure, 50 PSI. So automatically, if the flow rate is uh, small, just the, the single valve, the half inch valve works and uh, to a level in such a way that they the valve itself is able to manage this uh, reduced flow. 
when the flow rate increases automatically because of the friction loss and the set pressure, the difference in set pressure drives the second valve to open automatically to manage the full flow. This is one of the possible uh, use of very simple uh, system and uh, with a really proven, proven effect. Very good, very good, very efficient. Depending on the configuration, hot water recirculation loop can be located at the riser or at the branch circuit. PRVs, this is a rule, have to be installed off the loop in a range depending on the user circuits. Recirculation pump can be installed at the water heater level. This is normally the, the condition where it is installed. A couple of diagrams just showing a possible use of the first stage and second stage PRVs working together. So we, have, we can have recirculation at the riser, and then the PRVs are, um, are branched off the riser. So you have the first stage PRV controlling uh, in parallel or single, single control um, the first re uh, pressure reduction. Then you have the second stage PRV that can work uh, individually or they can work in parallel. So this is a, one of the possible configuration in terms of depending on your network. Another one can be the recirculation at branch circuit. So in this case, which is the, the, the distribution that uh, person I like really much because it has given a proven, proven uh, good behavior is to have the branch circuit and recirculation at the branch and every branch balanced in the proper way with balancing valve here and then you have the first stage and the second stage branched off the, the loop. Another question is, do I need pressure reducing valve in the recirculation piping? This is a, the, 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 the tricky thing, the difficult. So you have a typical schematic taken from literature on some, uh, some real, real design, <coughs> design schematics. You, we can see that this is absolutely wrong. So it means that the, the recirculation pump can't manage the high pressure drop created by the, the PRV, which is installed in series with the pump. If the PRV is installed in the recirculation pipe, the PRV pressure drop can be 100 PSI between the inlet and outlet, doesn't allow water to circulate. And the calculation of the flow rate is normally based on the heat losses from the hot water supply to the first point in the supply piping, normally quite normal way of calculation, and the pump up head is selected uh, based on the, the pressure losses of the entire closed loop. So we're talking about 10, 15 PSI maximum, so so high difference. And the high-rise buildings, this is important, use the same calculation method. So no special rules for high-rise buildings in, in terms of calculation of the loop itself. Another example, more or less trying to explain the same principle, the same problem. So even though even this one is clearly wrong because the PRV here is in series with the pump. This, in this case, the right, the right configuration of the network should be this one where you have free circulation of the, of the hot water through the loop and all the PRVs are branched off and separate from the recirculation loop. Then another main topic related to the good uh, sizing, the good uh, behavior of the network. So how do I balance the recirculation riser in high rise applications? And for this thing, I will uh, come back, go back to, to Kevin's uh, and uh, he will continue with this presentation. All right, thanks, Claudio. So yeah, let's talk about balancing a little bit. This is, of course, very important for a number of different reasons. Um, first, I want to just touch on the three types of balancing valves. We have static balancing valves, and here are a, a, a bunch of products that are available uh, in the market today, some, some different brands. Uh, they all, with the exception of that one on the bottom right, they require uh, a commissioning tool. So they all have differential pressure taps and require a tool of some sort, a manometer or a digital differential pressure meter to set the flow. So those are static balancing valves. Been around for a long time and they, they work great at a certain point. Dynamic balancing flow rate, fixed flow rate balancing valves uh, actually maintain a constant GPM. So they're different. They have a cartridge inside 
that moves back and forth opposed by a spring to maintain a constant GPM as the differential pressures fluctuate. So they are different uh, compared to a manual valve in that they have this constant flow rate. And something that we've been really uh, talking to a lot of people about is uh, dynamic thermal balancing valves. Um, again, I have a lot of information on this by itself. We'll just touch on it a little bit here. They modulate, they actually modulate the flow to maintain temperature. So uh, I'd like to say that they're a temperature solution for a temperature problem. Uh, you basically install them. There is no commissioning or, or tools required to put these in the system. And uh, they're really great for retrofitting. You can just put those in. We've seen a number of installations where those are installed in existing buildings and they corrected a big balancing problem. So there's a, that silver one there is a manufacturer has been around for a long time. Good product. Uh, it's all stainless. And then the one on the left, the Kalepi product, is the 116, so uh, technologically they're similar. So you can use any of these valves in risers or branch circuits. Uh, that's that's not, there are no limitations there, um, but we wanna make sure that we, we you know stress the fact that balancing each circuit is gonna give you better control. So what you wanna do is balance each of the branch circuits. So that's usually a smaller valve size three quarters, sometimes half inch, uh, which again is going to serve a, a circuit that in turn serves a number of fixtures. And we need to make sure that we have the, the pressure rating required for high rises. So as we get into these higher pressures, we just wanna make sure that the balancing valves that we select are, are appropriate. I mentioned thermal balancing. I, I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail, but I do wanna show you how they work. So this is a cutaway of a Kalefi product, the 116. And uh, you can see there that the, inside the flow comes from the left and it goes through this uh, valve and seat design and then and then on through the valve. So this is a thermal, what I call a thermal motor and it, it measures the temperature of the incoming water. It expands and contracts to open and close this valve seat right here. And graphically, this is what it looks like. Uh, for example, if we had the adjustment dial set at 130 degrees Fahrenheit, the valve would maintain a minimum position at that temperature and anything greater. So there's a small flow coming through there uh, with a CV of 0.23 at that point. So the, the thermal element can always respond to temperature changes in the water. If that incoming temperature should drop, what happens? The, the uh, the uh, thermal element contracts to open the valve seat up and the valve modulates open. And this valve, this particular valve has a 60 degree throttling range. So from minimum to full open is, uh, is represented by this line here. And what does that mean? Say our, for example, our water supply uh, dropped off in temperature because maybe it's not size big enough. Uh, these valves will all work together dynamically where it, no, no matter where they are in the system to dynamically balance the, all the flows throughout the system to maintain temperature. So it's a great, great theory and it works very well. We wanna stress the importance of having a check valve installed with a balancing device. Why, why, do, we need to, why do we need to do that? Um, it's possible to get reverse flow through a balancing valve, depending on what kind of fixtures and devices you have in one loop. If you get a big draw on a loop that's adjacent to another loop, maybe you have a Roman tub or something like that and you open that wide, it can actually draw flow backwards through the other loop and cause an imbalance. So here's a picture of the, the thermosetter with the check valve on the, on the outlet of the valve, very important. Here's a picture of one that's installed. This is actually a project out in Colorado. And this was a retrofit project. Here's the check valve right here. So you want isolation valves, of course, for any service down the road. It's not a matter of if, but, but when, that you have to clean these uh, as any valve. And there's the check right there. So that's a nice installation picture. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the point of distribution mixing valves, the master mixing valves. What about those in a high rise? Um, <clears throat> do we need one large master mixer or multiple smaller valves? Let's talk about that a little bit. Normally it, it would look like this, okay? You would have a master point of uh, distribution mixing valve located at the heater 
And here's a schematic uh, that we can look at. For example, uh, if we had a storage tank, uh, it's very common to see a requirement of 140 Fahrenheit. Maybe we mix down, uh, temper the water and send it out to the building at 130. And maybe we bring it back at 120. If we've designed our recirculation system for a 10 degree uh, delta T. So that, that's a very common schematic here. And this is the, the Kalefi Legio mix product with the controller that uh, has control over the water temperature. We're measuring the return recirculation temperature here, the tempered water temperature. And uh, anyway, that, that's a schematic that you can find in the, in the Kalefi literature and in that hydronics that I referred to earlier. So there's a typical system with one valve. Now you can also put multiple valves at multiple levels um, and put like one master mixing valve at each level. Now what happens, uh, right Claudio, this gets complicated because then you have a recirculation loop for maybe for each uh, master mixing valve, right? And um, then uh, just, you, you can do it, certainly works fine, but uh, it just gets a little more complicated and you wanna be really careful with your design, yeah. right? right. I mentioned uh, thermal disinfection or Legionella control. This is uh, obviously a huge topic. Uh, uh, we'd be glad to get into great detail with anyone that's interested. Just let us know. Uh, we're just gonna touch on it a little bit here relative to high rise buildings. Yes, it's a proven uh, th thermal disinfection. Elevating the temperature is a proven method and I'm gonna show you how that works uh, for all types of buildings. It can be a small senior living center or it can be uh, you know, a 90 story high rise, the thermal disinfection principle works in any building. Uh, but what, what's really important, and the larger the building, the more important the balancing comes into play because the balancing has to be done properly to minimize stagnation. Now think about uh, if we do a thermal disinfection strategy where we are elevating the temperature, uh, we need to make sure that our balancing valves are able to somehow bypass that high temperature flow. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. Here's an example of what that cycle might look like. Now this is uh, related to our product, the Legio Mix. Here's, here's what it does. Let's say at, uh, <clears throat> you set the program to automatically go into disinfection at 2 a.m., for example and you want it to end at 3 a.m. What you do is set a couple of set points, one of those being a 30 minute time. Uh, we could say, for example, that we wanna increase our storage temperature to 160 if it's not already there. We want to reset our set point to 150 and we want to do that for 30 minutes. So here's what that would look like. Here, this, this uh, dark brown line here, is my mixed temperature, my tempered water. The, the controller will at two o'clock start to elevate that tempered water temperature and get it up to 150. Meanwhile, it's watching the return temperature. This is the really important temperature right here, the dotted line. And once that valve gets up to 150, it will run that for as long as it takes to get 30 minutes of confirmed return water temperature at or above 140. Okay, right here. So this, these are all parameters that you can set, but this is scheduled, it's automatic uh, in our product and it will do it whatever, whenever you set it up to do this. And that's what this looks like in terms of the mixed temperature and the return temperature. Uh, if the cycle fails for some reason, if you don't get 30 minutes of full 140 return, uh, you will get a message saying the disinfection cycle was not successful. Um, otherwise, you'll get a message that it was successful, and then the controller uh, will have all that data in the data logging, and the building automation system can record all that, uh, and it's all recorded. Now, this is uh, these these valves are used uh, all throughout the world. Uh, it's a proven system. They work great in high rises, actually any building. And I just wanted to show you what that cycle looks like uh, graphically. Uh, again, the, 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 importance is, the important thing is that we measure and record this cycle because then the building manager or the building owner has proof that the water uh, has been sanitized. 
when we're doing this, when we're doing this elevated temperature cycle, we need to be able to bypass the thermal balancing valves. And here's an example of, of what we do to accomplish that. This is a 116 series thermal setter valve. We saw it earlier. And there's an option to put a little zone valve right here in this extra extra part of the um, the balancing valve. And what we can do with that, it's a uh, 24 volt two wire uh, on off spring return closed actuator. That's a mouthful. And uh, you can run a pair of wires around to all your balancing valves and energize those actuators whenever you want to do a bypass. So here's an example of what that would look like. The valve will open up to a larger CV to allow significant flow through the valve during that thermal disinfection period. Um, the other option, oh, I wanna point out one or two other things here. This right here is actually a slide in temperature gauge. You can, if you have a building automation system in a large high rise, you can just slip in, pull this gauge out and slip in here a little temperature bulb, uh, you know, a, a, a sensor of some type and uh, run the wires back to an analog input on your BAS and read all of the temperatures at all of your recirculation circuits uh, and have all that information uh, on hand for the building manager. The other way to do bypass is with a self-contained thermal bypass. And this one fits in the same location in the 116 valve. And what it will do, it will automatically do a bypass at 155 degrees. So when that water coming down to the valve hits 155, this is a quick opening thermal bypass and it will pop open again to this level. And uh, if the water temperature continues to increase, it will actually balance when you get up into this range here uh, above 170. So this one is self-contained. It doesn't require uh, a control signal out to the valves to, to let that bypass work. So, gosh, we went went through this kind of fast uh, today. Um, again, I hope you're entering questions uh, in, in the questions box. I don't have access to that right now, but um, let's go ahead and, and wrap this up. We talked about static pressure in high rises. We talked about multiple loops, one large loop or different zones and the different ways to do that. And uh, remember, you can get a copy of this presentation too if you wanna get those schematics to refer to. Uh, we talked about locating the water heaters. You know, uh, wh where are they? Up, down, um, in the middle somewhere. We talked about PRVs, right? Don't put the PRVs uh, in, in the research line, okay? Balancing, we, we talked a little bit about balancing and we can talk about that some more in other presentations, just let us know. Point of distribution, the master mixing valves, we, we touched on that. Uh, we touched on the Legionella. Uh, I hope, and I know we, we finished a little early today, but I hope you enjoyed this session. Please send your comments and questions and we'll, we'll get back to you. And um, I wanna thank, uh, thank Claudio again for being here. Thanks very much, Claudio. Thank, thanks, Kevin. Thanks everybody. All right, well, have a great afternoon. We'll see everybody in October.